Good evening, everyone. My name is Christopher Urbain, the webinar coordinator for the AFQ Inspection Division. I wanted to thank you all for calling in for this evening's event, which is titled, The Cost of Quality Without Dollars is the Theory of Constraints. Our speaker tonight is Grace Duffy. She's an expert in business and process management solutions. She's authored over 15 texts, additional book chapters, and many articles on quality and leadership, including an upcoming quality magazine article that will be published in October, for which this material is, is a nice preview into that article. Grace holds an MBA from Georgia State University and a number of other professional credentials, including from ASQ. She's a CMQ, OE, a CQIA, a Six Sigma Green Belt, and a CQA. She also holds a Lean Sigma Master Black Belt, and she's an ASQ Fellow and Distinguished Service Medalist. Grace, if you'd like to begin your presentation, um, by all means, I'll open up the floor to you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that introduction. And I'm delighted to be here. I was saying that I haven't had the opportunity of working with the Infection Division all that much, and this is a real delight, so thank you. I hope what I share with you is useful for you in looking at the frontline measurements and what those measurements roll up to when we think about prioritization of improvement and sustainability and improvement of the organization. This cost of quality without dollars is something that I ran into. It just occurred to me as I was working with Centers for Disease Control and Prevention some years ago. You know, the CDC is very involved right now in the COVID-19. I was uh, uh, working with them just after the SARS virus several years ago, and they asked me to talk about the cost of quality and share with them, because I used to be the, uh, uh, the chair of the Quality Cost Committee with the Quality Management Division, and then have taught the cost of quality course with Doug Wood for some years now. Uh, and, and so when, I, when they ask for customized courses, very often the society will ask me to go on because I know out a little bit about instructional design. So I was, as I was working with the, uh, the PhD, the director of the laboratories up at the CDC about taking dollars out of cost of quality, I thought, well, geez, this sure looks an awful lot like theory of constraints. So I've been thinking about this for the last year or so, and I, I wanted to put a paper together. And this presentation gave me the opportunity to really put my thoughts in order and, and then also get the paper written. So this has been a really great opportunity. Where I'd like to go today is to for those of you who may not know the details of cost of quality or theory of constraints, I'm not going to teach them. For those of you who teach it already and you're rolling your eyeballs, I won't drag you through kicking and screaming but I wanna give enough about cost of quality and theory of constraints, at least to show the connections between the two of them. And then one of the big differences between the two is there are different audiences. Voice of the customer is gonna be different with the people who are gonna benefit most from looking at cost of quality as they are from the people who are gonna benefit most from theory of constraints, at least in the, in the short term, in the operational scope. Then I want to talk about how measurements from the theory of constraints flow up to the cost of quality, where you have not only the vertical roll-up of measurements, but also the horizontal connection across the value chain or the supply chain, and how both of them help us in executive decision-making. Then as, as a wrap-up, I want to come back to the role of both perspectives between cost of quality and theory of constraints. We in quality management or the executives in the organization are very focused on cost of quality. We use it for priorities for the, the top line and the bottom line of the organization. And then there's the Jonah that I will describe, who is the one who really facilitates the, the theory of constraints and then is, is the ambassador, if you will, uh, to the whole organization to keep theory of constraints, uh, to keep the, uh, the, the uh, exploitation of bottlenecks going in the organization. So I want to start with cost of quality. And I did share with our, our host that um, if, if I say something that causes a real disruption, he will stop me. But if not, we'll go ahead and take some question and answers at the end. Uh, once I get rolling, I can't see anything on the screen other than my slides. So I won't be able to see the chat, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to leave that 
to to our host. Okay, we got it better. All right, now Excellent. you guys are seeing. Excellent. Thank you. You are good. You were having such a wonderful conversation. Well, let me come back from the beginning so people can see the thing, and then I'll just go through these quickly so you know that you had it. All right, there we go. So we have theory of constraints. You've seen that, and then here are the objectives. And by the way, this uh, presentation will be up on the Inspection Division website, so you can download it when we're done. So thank you for interrupting me. Cost equality, this is as far as we got. So we're good. So let's take a definition of cost of quality and quality cost. There is a traditional definition of cost of quality, and this comes out of about the second edition or the third edition of the principles of quality cost from the Quality Cost Committee. Jet Campanella some years ago was chair of that committee and wrote some of the original books beyond Joseph Duran and, uh, and Phil Crosby's concepts. Here we're talking about cost of quality costs represent the difference between the actual cost of a product or service and what the reduced costs would be if there were no possibility of substandard service, failure products or defects in their manufacture. Now what that means is, for those of you who have put in a, uh, uh, a budget, you know that when we put a budget together, and here is a slide that is basically, a, it's a mini SIPOC, we had the input requirements on the left and the output of the product or the service on the right. We want to budget and, and account for resources for people, facilities, equipment, and time. All right, so we put a budget together. The upper block and the process block are the normal activities and resources that we know that we need to run the business or our portion of it. We also know that Murphy's Laws are there that says anything that can go wrong will. So we also know that we need to put in some specific time for quality planning, quality assurance, quality control, quality inspection, quality improvement. We know that there are certain activities that are going to be beyond what the normal business would be if absolutely everything went perfectly. Now the cost of quality concept says that we are going to identify what those costs are to prevent, and I don't know whether you can, hopefully you can see my, my uh, pointer here. We want to prevent activities. Oh, if you click on this thing, we want to prevent activities. We want to appraise. Many of us are quality auditors. We are systems auditors or internal auditors. We want to watch the process as it's going on. We also want to catch any failures that happen internally to the organization before the customer sees it. In healthcare, it's before the patient uh, experiences the interaction. And failure external is anything that the customer sees. And what we call this is the PATH model, the prevention, appraisal, and failure model. And what we want to do is maximize the return on investment for the organization. Now, anymore, as we have global organizations, that return on investment is not just for our own four walls. It is for the whole supply or value chain. So we look at convention, we look at conformance costs, which are prevention and appraisal, where we conform to what the process says. And then we have costs of non-conformance, failure uh, internally or externally. And for those of you who took the CFQOE exam, one of the, the favorite uh, constructed responses we used to have was describe what you would do in a cost of quality arena in planning for process improvement. You absolutely get rid of every external failure. You minimize external failure as much as possible. You balance the appraisal costs to uh, uh, prevention and appraisal and watching to make sure that things don't go south on your process, that you're still, your capability is, is, uh, is positive, and then you want to put most of your effort into prevention. That's the concept of cost of quality. And here is a chart that I've used for, for a long time that, that would, would uh, tie a lot to what we're talking about. If we're looking at quality planning, this QP here, in quality planning, the quality management system is designed, planned, and organized for defect prevention. That's the Phil Crosby do it right the first time, the Phil Crosby zero defects. 
that's the least costly. For those of you who teach Introduction to Quality, you know that Dr. Duran started with that concept of 1, 10, and 100. It costs you about a dollar to design it right to begin with. It costs maybe $10 to appraise and watch and monitor while the process, the product or service is, is being created. It takes $100 relatively to clean up a mess once it happens. So we really want to spend a lot of time in this quality planning, quality prevention. And the quality assurance, quality control, and quality improvement is that $10 piece on the 110 and 100. And here is where we as the provider finds and corrects the errors internally. It's better if we find them early on in the production or service, that old concept of garbage in and garbage out. And then finally, the most costly is in service recovery, where we lose our reputation. And this was where we really spent a lot of time when I was working with the Centers for Disease Control in making sure that their laboratories were performing the tests properly, that any of the tests and the findings that were, that were um, presented to the public or presented to the healthcare and the medical environment were trustworthy, had integrity, and were repeatable and reliable, just like you and I working on our processes. So that's really the cost of quality. So what we find is that if we look at cost of quality, if we take the dollars out of it, the impacts aren't just dollars in what happens in our business if we incur those external failures. We waste resources, time, the skills and abilities of our people. Those are the eight ways of living. We risk our reputation when we neglect to keep the total system in mind. And that's really where Elihu Goldratt, who, who wrote The Goal, which is the business novel that introduced theory of constraints, that's where he was going. So let's take one more look here at um, the path model where we want to go. And the theory of constraints will also do this, but without the dollars. If we have failure and we start with large amounts of internal external failure, we will have a certain amount of design, prevention, and appraisal activities, but we still have failure. The more we put into prevention and appraisal, this is the investment, this is our return on investment, the more we're going to then reduce our cost of failure. Now, on the interim, going down to a total reduction, and, and a better return on investment, we may end up still having failures we need to address and spend resources on, but we have also increased our performance, our, our prevention and appraisal. But we still have not increased the amount that we are spending in total. Over time, and generally it's a relatively short time, on some cycles, you're going to reduce and hopefully totally uh, minimize or, or uh, uh, eliminate external failures, and then you're going to be able to better manage internal failures. So the total cost of non-conformance is much lower, and the cost of conformance, which is prevention and appraisal, also reduces down to a sustainable uh, amount. Now, Dr. Duran, in one of his earlier um, quality control handbooks, he cha later changed the, the name of it to Quality Handbook, about the fifth or the sixth edition. Originally thought that there was a cost benefit, a payback balance to cost of quality. And here you'll see this chart where you have a cost of good unit of the product and the quality of conformance, the percent of performance of, of spending to reduce the internal or external failures. And you'll see this line here of the reduction of failure costs as the cost of, of appraisal plus prevention goes up. They thought, or originally thought, that there was this sweet spot right here where the total cost of quality, of conformance and non-conformance, got a low point, and then beyond that, it would start going back up to infinity. That that last erg of quality, that 99.9999%, would take so many resources that it was not a good return on investment. As we looked more at systems, as we got into the 1980s, the late 70s, where uh, Feigenbaum and some of the others started really talking about total systems, and we stopped looking in silos or departments, 
Duran and others finally realized, and Joe DeFeo is still writing about this in the latest uh, quality handbook, that we can look at this graph and the cost of goods of unit of product can still, it still costs us money to have materials and resources and people, the same three-legged stool we have in lean. But what we see here is that we can drive failure costs down to zero, hypothetically, the cost of appraisal and prevention if you get the failure cost down to zero here, still will be something, but the total quality cost will then be completely consumed by controllable or conformance costs. So that was the concept, and that's where we really drive, and that's Phil Crosby's zero defects concept as well. So what we find is that there are other approaches to the cost of quality, and one of those approaches is that we can look at the impact of resources, time, and people without putting dollar signs on them. Now, the CEO and the executives who are looking at the annual report, they're looking at the financial reports, we all know that if you really want to present facts and get the, the interest of executive management, you want to put it into dollar signs. But as you go down farther into the organization, you have less of a focus on anything more than our individual budgets, but we're looking at system-wide use of resources, the balance of that, that three-legged stool of value and delivery and quality, and what we're valuing uh, and, and um, uh, quality, quality, delivery, and time. So here we go. What we wanna do is describe the impact of poor service or product and there are methodologies that we use for that, and that determines the organizational resources. So we wanna look at the quality from dollars and cents, certainly, but we also wanna use uh, the idea of preventing poor quality in the use of resources, time, and people. We wanna appraise quality as those processes are going on, and we wanna address the quality failures, internal and external, at at the ground level, where the process is actually happening, that go to Gamba that we talk about. And this takes us to the theory of constraint, which is where we come from with uh, Elihu Goldratt. Now, the quality, cost of quality concept, I didn't get really deeply into it. Some of you already know it and could teach it better than I can. So I didn't make any deep uh, explanation of it, and I'm not gonna make a deep explanation of theory of constraints other than to tie it together into a lean management philosophy. It, we stress the removal of constraints to increase throughput while decreasing inventory and operating expenses. It is a lean management prop, uh, philosophy. So the TOC set of tools looks at that entire system for continuous improvement. And that's a very important piece for uh, Elihu Goldratt. He is, although he talks about bottlenecks, he talks about the weak link in the chain, he talks about batch sizes of one or cutting batch sizes. He says that the message is the same for any aspect of any company, from product design or marketing to manufacturing and distribution. The actions of marketing are guided by the concept of cost and margins, okay, even more than the, action, the actions of production. But the cost and margins in marketing are the dollars. You and I, in the process of work on the front line, at the customer facing position or in the manufacturing floor need to look at those actions of production in the use of resources, time, and people. That's where we want to go. Oh, right. Five steps of focusing together for his theory of constraints. We want to identify that system constraint. If you really look at this, this is Duran's seven step process improvement model. Duran says, redefine the problem. Well, yeah, the problem is a constraint. It's keeping us from getting where we wanna go. Decide how to exploit the system's constraint. When I first read the goal, and then when I went into, the, into Goldratt's later Theory of Constraints book, Goldratt's um, first language was not English, and I always had a little trouble with the term exploit and the term elevate here in number four uh, until I learned more about it. When you look at a bottleneck, you want to exploit that bottleneck. That means you want to focus so well on it, you know exactly how to open up that constraint and get the flow of the product or the service or the, the uh, process 
going as smoothly as it possibly can. Then in three, you want to subordinate everything else to the above decision. What that means is you want to start with the most constraining constraint, the one that is uh, the highest barrier to your consistent throughput, to your return on investment. And, you, and nothing else is important as that until you resolve it. So that's number three. Then number four is elevate the system's constraints. That means you are looking at the whole system to say where are the bottlenecks. The bottleneck may not be within our own plant. The bottleneck may be that we have a problem with a, a, a hurricane on the Atlantic trying to get a ship over from the Dardanelles over into the East Coast somewhere. That may not be our plan. It may be part of our distribution center system. We need to understand those total system constraints. And if in the previous steps the constraint has been broken, then we go back to step number one, go over it again. And that's the business of rinse and repeat that we all use. So that's really where, where Goldratt took the concept of cost of quality down to the front lines of what we're trying to do. So the theory of constraints look at systems improvement even more than cost of quality. Some of you who have learned in cost of quality talked about activity-based costing, and that is a very focused approach to costing. That is not necessarily a systems view unless you make sure that you understand and have good relationships with your suppliers, your distribution system, uh, and your total customers to understand the cost of that whole value system. Theory of constraints focuses on the resources within that, and that's defined more specifically in our interdependent processes and how we work with them. So th this is where uh, Goldratt got the analogy of a system is a chain. It is interdependent links working together, and the constraint is the weakest link. So we want to focus on that one. That's the exploit and focus, there we are. By the way, I've got a couple of footnotes down here uh, that can be useful for you in some references of where I've gotten some additional material. Now, Goldratt had the same idea. This chart probably looks a lot like what Duran had in the quality handbook. Now, he's looking here on batch size, but it's the same sort of concept of the cost per unit here on the, on the, the, uh, uh, the y-axis and the x-axis is best op optimum batch size. And again, you can see that there is a cost per unit as a function of batch size. Consider the cost of unit. Cost per unit is going to go up. The batch size is eventually going to come down to nothing. And the cost per unit, because you've got inventory, is going to go up after some amount of this sweet spot here of a balance of uh, being able to uh, uh, maximize the use of re resources and then having for storage uh, and at, as your, your batch size goes down and you have to keep things, things uh, in, in uh, inventory and what we do. So Goldratt worked with that one. So let's tie together cost of quality and theory of constraints and look at the different audiences and who we want to work with on these, these costs. And the cost of quality is really the language of the executive. So as mentioned earlier, both cost of quality and theory of constraints seek to improve results and use for resources to accomplish those results. Both approaches also need a way to make sure the results are what the customer, either internal or external, wants. The executive function sets the policy based on financial goals. As the business operates, financial reports are generated reflecting the results of operations to meet the goals. And those are the reports are lagging indicators to show the level of attainment during an operating cycle. And we see here cost of quality, if you're looking at the, the uh, pyramid, of the levels of, of organizational hierarchy, the executive level is giving us the financial priorities down through the business. And then the, the, the lower level, the operational and functional, need to translate that into process and procedures. And they then send back results and metrics. And then you have that feedback of the KPIs of what we do. So the priorities are set during the strategic planning sessions. We attain a set of objectives that cascaded down to the executive, to the divisional and functional management. Those financial goals then translate into tactical and operational objectives, and then those are broken down into processes and procedures and finally into tasks. And it's those front line tasks 
that we need to generate indicators for that become our leading indicators of daily, weekly, or monthly success. And those are the ones we then roll back up to tie to the divisional and the, uh, the corporate financials for the annual reports. Now, one thing that, that I found, and most of you know this, that most failures are at the interfaces. Most of us, if we're running a, a relay race or whatever, you know the runner generally is on their form. They're doing really well. Where somebody stumbles is when they're waiting to grab the baton from the previous runner to pick to the new runner, or they pass, or the runner stumbles, or something happens. Same happens when you're passing from one process to the other. Cost of quality looks at the monetary impact to the business, often after the activity or error occurs. It's actually too late to do much of anything other than corrective action and feedback into the next cycle of planning. The theory of constraints is closer to the action. And there we can look at processes and the sub-elements, and we can look at tangible items from one step and the other. This is where we really get into the CAPA concept, the corrective action piece, that then feeds into preventive action the next level around. So we want to use this difference of perspective to create the lagging and leading indicators for the feedback loop of continuous improvement. Now, there's a chart I've used for some years, probably 20 years or so, uh, this actually came out of a uh, Getz and Davis theory of total quality textbook from years ago. Really a good chart that I've used a lot for strategic planning. Here we want to align our measures for effectiveness. Up at the executive side, you've got the cost of quality. The executives need to write the annual report. They're responsible and accountable for that annual report. You get the cost of quality coming in. You have the mission and the vision statement here setting up corporate goals, and then those goals are fed down into the functional area executives or spread back to the supply chain if you're working in SIPOP with your supply relationships or your customer relationships in setting up what your final goals and results are going to be. Now, the lagging indicators are set as KPIs and the corporate goals and some of the high-level objectives in the functional areas. At that point, then, the functional areas take those objectives cascade them down into tasks that are then measured and the indicators are set at the ground level. That policy goes down, actions and dates come up. So the tasks are communicated up there with the leading indicators. So theory of constraints is very, very involved in what is happening now. We're much more uh, tied to the immediate, where we can stop and appraise something and, and eliminate an error before it happens. Once we get up to the lagging indicators, it's too late. All we can do is lessons learned. There are some mis misconceptions, easy for me to say, about productivity and quality and return on investment that we've known about for some years. Theory of constraints as a lean module reinforces this whole idea of the misconceptions that you can't have higher quality and lower expenses. We know from the change in Duran's uh, illustrations that that last 99% or 1% of quality really isn't going to drive your expenses up to infinity. What it's going to do is help you better balance your resources, time, and people across that whole supply chain. You're going to work with each other and get rid of the silos and the fiefdom. That customer satisfaction is related to value. Customers understand when they see value. Now, it's to our responsibility in marketing and in our customer relationships to help the customer see that value. Certainly, we don't want to sit on the sidelines, but we want to work with the customer so that they perceive that quality and price. We get the Kano model where we have the must have, the desired, and the delighted activity so that we know our customers well enough. And then we do have to schedule the adherence and on-time delivery. And they are related to quality. We can have the very, very best product, but if it's too late for when we need it, we can have the very, very best vaccine, but if we don't get it in five, until five years from now, I'm not sure what's going to happen with our economy. So we've, we've heard that on the daily news, both from Dr. Fauci and from from other people on the news, 
that we need this stuff and we need it very quickly, but we aren't going to, to quibble on the quality. We aren't going to take shortcuts. Quality is responsibility only of the shop floor? No, it's not. It's the responsibility of everybody. It's not just the laboratories that care about whether that vaccine for COVID-19 is right. It's everybody all the way up to the Centers for Infection and the Centers for Disease Control. So we can see that these common misconceptions, we've learned as we look more at a system uh, that, that we can have a good solid return on investment. Let's take a look at some of the data and the measurement flows between cost of quality and theory of constraint. This chart looks at the organizational improvement. It is a strategic component of continuous improvement. And this diagram demonstrates the two different kinds of quality cost approaches, project-based and systemic or formal systems, because there's both formal quality tracking systems on the top of this chart and informal estimates on the lower part of the, ch the chart. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And then you can see the business goals, which are the standard formal inputs that we use for financial an analysis. And then on the left, you have more of the continuing, the kappa kinds of, of activities and more of the quantitative activities that, that go on. So we look at the, the systems that support the improvement in cycle. That top-down approach uses cost of quality that prioritizes, that prioritizes the improvement opportunities based on revenue and expense analysis. The bottom-up approach looks at the cap of the corrective action leading to preventive action at the daily management level, often addressing the internal failures, audit findings, which is what you and I do a lot of, and the production and process and the lean opportunity. Both perspectives use the same targeted metrics. Actually, it's not true. We use targeted metrics out of the same database, but we sort the common data differently out of that database. So it's the heart of that new digital platform. We're talking a lot about quality 4.0 now and the digital models. It's the data and the analytics that enable this fluidity from the quantitative to the qualitative activities and value creation. So these data data, dashboards help the companies respond more tightly to align the service and product. It also helps us measure productivity, improved use of, of resources. So the quality cost database is a, a means to track the consolidated digital platform. So both cost of quality can use this same database and the theory of constraints because the data is there and can be simulated in different ways. Here is an example that I put together for another paper that we wrote for one of the Baldrige journals. And it, it comes from some work I've done with uh, the public health departments. And then I just watched the, the same evening news you have. If you look at a measurement flow example in this table, there are three columns, the level of measurement of the organization from the United States government, the federal government down I'm in Florida, so I'm listening to Florida News. The state of Florida, Governor DeSantis gives us our, our at least weekly debriefings. The county, I get Lake County uh, texts um, actually every day on the COVID numbers uh, that we have. The city and municipality, I go to my, my commissioner's meetings. The local hospital, I, I have some friends who are nurses and physicians at the hospital. Local school, I certainly get involved with some of my friends who are teachers. And then the public service organization, as I say, I get involved with public health all the time. And I also am involved in, in a local homeless shelter. I contribute and, and work with them somewhat. So I get this feedback and we can see that the kinds of measures we have differ by the level. And that makes sense. We cascade those measurements. So if we look from top to bottom, you and I on the evening news are hearing the COVID infection rates, we're hearing the trends, we're seeing the graphs, we're looking at the death rate by age and ethnicity and income level. Now, we may not be seeing all of that, but those are being reported through the departments of health, through the hospitals, through the uh, state and county organizations for infection rates, the totals, the deaths in the cities, whatever, and segmented by county. And they are being fed up to the CDC, into the, uh, the government organization, into health and human services. And at that level, we're also getting huge budget allocations per agency, and we're hearing what those allocations are. 600 million is going here, another 3 billion is going here, another 2 trillion is going over here. So we're hearing those dollars. 
Now, as we get farther down into the organization, certainly the budgets are important. The federal government is feeding a good bit of funding down out of that 600 million or 2 trillion or whatever it is to help the organizations. But the reporting is much more specific to the disease for COVID-19. We're hearing much more about COVID-19 infections, total and deaths by municipality. I hear a little bit on the evening news about how much money is spent by my local uh, school district on masks and on cleaning and on, on additional sterilization, but not so much. It gets much more detailed and more operative as we go down. Uh, the local schools are going to report all infectious diseases to the CDC and to the state, to the public health department. The public service organizations, the Orlando Public Health Office, has been reporting uh, disease, contagious diseases for years. I've gotten involved with them in, in some of those processes uh, for, for about 10 or 15 years now. And then even the homeless shelters and the hospitals are identifying the infectious disease totals. So you have a narrowing of the measurements, uh, and then they get rolled back up to understand at the national level. So these measurements come back and forth, and they are aligned to the return on investment to not only the budgets, but to the health coming through from health and human services. So let me swap gears a little bit and talk about who's involved in driving this systems view, both vertically and horizontally, for the connection between cost of quality and theory of constraint. For us in the theory of or in the cost of quality, forgive me, we in quality management and leadership of the organization have a view that looks to me an awful lot like the cycle for the ISO, where management is responsible for setting the goals. If we look at the ongoing management review, we are responsible for process and product monitoring at the return on investment level. We identify the priorities of improvement projects. Certainly, that's what a Pareto chart for cost of quality would do. We're looking for stakeholder satisfaction and complaint. We are looking at the satisfaction, the more general, and then we're also looking at complaints coming in at the more operational and immediate issues. And we're looking at return on investment at not only the top line of the revenues, but also the bottom line of what our net profits are going to be, or if we're not for profit, what our capital retention is that we can roll back into the organization. So we have executive summaries that then feed into direction for progress and to provide resources, the balancing of the resources, and that, that's the continuing management review that then gives us that internal audit that gives us the lessons learned that feeds back into the next cycle. So we've got that concept that we as managers are responsible for at the systems and organizational level. Now, what we need to do, and here I come back to a quote from Elihu Goldratt, and this comes out of his Theory of Constraints book, Keep an eye on the connections. Here he's coming back to the interfaces. The connection between production, local process improvements, engineering, remember that's the design and prevention, marketing, and most importantly, finance, is now emerging into a totally new holistic pattern. Goldrat got it. He understood the concepts of cost of quality before he ever really developed his theory of constraints model. He saw that the two are hand in hand. And, and I'm impressed, the more I study what Goldratt had, that he really understood systems at, at a very high level. So what are some critical success factors for us if we look at the management of quality? We must focus on that ROI at the top level from the executive down when addressing impacts with strategic management initiatives. What literally, excuse the pun, is the goal of the organization? And we're driving that at the high level and we are going to exploit those significant quality impacts. That's the Pareto chart of cost of quality that says, I'm going to look at the highest bleed of my finances and try and stop that bleeding as quickly as I can. And that translates down into constraints of throughput of the organization. I want to integrate that ROI into my management decision making. Well, yeah, and problem solving. Then I want to integrate into, two, into the improvement approaches. I don't want to keep the two separate. I don't want to keep the strategic and the operational 
separate. I want to integrate them to understand how one drives the other and that feedback loop and cycle. There's more on the critical success factors, understanding that we're measuring what really is meaningful for the return on investment of the business as a whole, including our supplier relationships and our customer relationships, and we want to be able to display them graphically. We must share our data. This is something we've seen a lot in the whole concept of the last five years of transparency, of having relationships with our suppliers rather than being in a conflict situation with them, of working closely with our customers, not trying to maintain confidentiality for fear that our distributors will take over our ideas and start selling them directly to customers. We need a better level of integrity and trust within our, our systems and our relationships. We need to be able to monitor those activities and tie between the cost of quality and the theory of constraints. Because the return on investment is the bridge in those qualities. And as Goldratt says, we need to keep the system going. We can't stop because again, that impedes the throughput. That stops the value chain and we don't wanna do that. So let's take a look at the, the bottom up role of what we do with the Jonah. Now, those of you who are already certified Jonas, uh, again, you could teach this better than I can. There is a certification for many of you in the lean environment in theory of constraints. Jonah is the name of the advisor of the uh, protagonist in the goal that Goldbrot uh, wrote. Jonah is the one who is sharing the uh, ideas and concepts of uh, reducing constraints, of increasing throughput, uh, and sequentially getting rid of the highest constraint so that your bottleneck moves to the next highest constraint and the next one, and you bounce from one to the other. So who is a Jonah? This is not somebody who's entry level to the organization. This is a senior leader or a leadership team, although I've not run into a team Jonah in my own experience. It's always been one particular master black belt or one particular sage uh, who is well, well placed and respected within the organization. Usually maybe, well, the ones in my experience, they're a senior engineer or they're a senior designer, uh, somebody who is a senior team leader in the organization. They're from the business function, so they have good visibility within the process groups. They have functional areas of responsibility. Uh, they work in project production, inventory-based areas. They're really where the resources are, and they can see a broad range of what goes on in the organization. They are the ones who can who connect that constraint-based decision-making to the impact on business performance. They've got to be able to see up and down in the organization, and they're effective at analyzing the current state realities, and then looking at the impact of the current state to where you're going to get in the future state. Then he uses, he or she, I've also met some she's, uh, uses a combination of logical thinking, and for those of you who've worked with De Bono, Edward De Bono's logical thinking, that causality and necessity, the provocation of innovation is something that is very useful with the Jonah. Oh, if you can't uh, get rid of that constraint this way, what's a workaround? How can we design around this particular bottleneck to look between business functions and the performance outcomes. So if we look at that, uh, who are the responsibilities of the Jonah? And as I mentioned, this role is not an entry level position. I have worked more recently since Six Sigma became uh, such a, 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 a frequent approach in use that it really is a master black belt level person. They need to understand systems and interaction of business and technology and people. The Jonah is an advisor to production who's also comfortable working with executive management. They cannot be intimidated by executive management. They need to be able to address both short and long-term improvements. They need to master the terminology of throughput, but also be able to talk dollars and cents, be able to work with marketing on, on approaches and, and ways to show value to customers. They need to expand that perspective in, in uh, house flow back to the distribution, back through the supply chain, and back forward into distribution and marketing, and then relationships with, uh, with partners. And they need to learn to identify and exploit and subordinate. They need to understand that cycle 
for that maximum return on investment. Let's look a little bit more at the responsibilities of Jonah. We want to look beyond operational waste to the policy constraints. There are times when we will want to maybe um, get rid of a batch and just isolate a batch and move on for now because we realize if we go back and rework that batch right now, we have constrained our throughput for later. Better to isolate that right now and get rolling somewhere else and deliver what we need to on time. Employ total quality management just in time. Meld them effectively with the higher level quality management. Get the leading indicators right so that we can attain those lagging indicators strategically. We want to establish the firm relationships. We want to maintain the written implementation. And I'm a real stickler for writing down what you're doing. If it's not written down, it doesn't exist. And most of you know that in documentation for quality planning and process. If it isn't written down, it doesn't exist. You can't help anybody learn it. And you need to coordinate that with the cost of quality. Keep the system going and here we go again. All right, let's wrap this one up. What have I done? I babbled at you for about 40 minutes, maybe a little bit, eh, 46, okay. We've looked at the, the cost of quality concepts just to describe and sort of juxtapose them with the theory of constraints. I've made a point that there are different audiences between cost of quality and theory of constraints. And the reason I've done that is because the language is different. And we need to make sure that we understand our audience. As quality managers, you and I are working up and we're working down and we're working sideways. So we have to be polyglots. We really need to understand putting the cost of quality into resources. What's it costing us? What's the impact to the top line? What's the impact to the bottom line? We need to be able to display that graphically in our champion reviews and our stage gates. But we also be able, need to be able to get down to the Gemba. We able to, need to be able to do those, those 5S walks and see what's going on down on the factory floor or in the service bay or at the service counter to see what's going on. And then we have to understand the measurements and how they flow, how they roll up uh, to the executive level. And then when the executives ask a question, how we can deconstruct those measurements to get back down that tree of indicators to identify specifically the area where the impact shows up. So then we also talked about the role of quality management and the role of the Jonah for theory of constraints and for cost of, uh, cost of quality. I've babbled on at you. Apparently there haven't been any tremendous issues other than that I forgot to share my screen and I thank you very much for letting me know that. I hope you've seen it. Let me open this up for discussion and I hope that we have some chat and, and I can answer or we can have some conversations back and forth. Let me hand this back. Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, we really appreciate it here. Usually what I do is um, I'll kick off with the first question. Uh, we've had almost 80 participants call in for this one and then wow. I'll, I'll go into some of the questions that some folks have typed into the box and this will give some of, some of them a little bit of time to do so, if there's anything on their mind. So I, I really want to go back uh, at first um, to when you mentioned you came up with this concept. I think you said you were working for the CDC and you were trying to come up with the concept of removing the cost uh, of quality from it. My, my question is, when, when you did that, when you removed the cost out of the scope of their thinking, how, how did they receive that? How did that affect their thinking as they moved ahead towards their process improvements? Really important question, thank you. And it's interesting because one of the very first things I was told by the director of the laboratories was our budget is set. If you talk to us about saving money, you're gonna lose us as an audience because if we don't spend the money we are funded from the health and human services, if we don't spend it all, we lose that same amount next year because they think we didn't need it. So I was cautioned right away, even before I signed the contract of working with them, don't talk about saving money. Talk about balance of resources, talk about cycle time, talk about throughput, talk about speed of delivery of results, but don't talk about saving money because that's a bad thing for them. 
if you save money, you lose it next year. What we wanted to do was to help them get the perfect balance of resources, time, and people so that they used every single bit of dollars they had, plus the 10% overage that they could get for anything else, and still get the maximum throughput of their responsibilities. Excellent, thank you. Um, there's a question from Melissa. She asked from early on in the presentation, so internal failure would be non-conformance and external corrective action. Is that correct? I probably misspoke. Uh, corrective action, well, you're going to correct anything external, and hopefully you're going to correct it really fast. Internal failure and external failure would both entail a corrective action. If you're ISO, then you know the concept of the kappa and, and, and being able to resolve those issues. The internal failure, the difference in the two in my mind is the external failure is the customer saw it. So the corrective action is probably going to be more intense and frankly, you want it almost immediately because the customer is watching you make reparations. The corrective action for a customer probably means you're gonna be very transparent with them. Now, you're not gonna open the kimono to show them all the internals, but you're gonna work with them so that they know that you have resolved it to their, uh, their satisfaction. The internal uh, corrective action uh, is uh, something that we can do, and depending on the severity of it, we can slow down a lower priority corrective action or failure in, in deference to one that's an external failure. So we have a little more slack in internal failure because nobody's watching us sweat and we haven't shown up on the two o'clock news or the channel two news at six, whatever it is. Corrective action, forgive me, should be in both. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, another question I had, uh, it relates back to the common misconception slide you have. And I, I like the way you were pointing out that, uh, that there should be some other perceived values. And from my personal experience, I teach supply chain classes. One of the things I want to point out that's changed and come to the surface in the forefront of industry in, within supply chain, and I don't know if it's come to the forefront of quality, is what we call the supply chain operations reference model. Essentially what that is, is they've kind of taken other KPIs in addition to cost for supply chain metrics, including, you know, getting the right quantity at the right time, to the right place, at the right quality, and at a fair price. So I, I just want to point out that's kind of a new outlook uh, within supply chain as well. And that's excellent because I've seen um, that in, in some, some other work, and you're right, because that really is, again, that three-legged stool of lean, and I'm really glad to see that is pervasive now across the whole supply or value chain. Thank you. That's excellent. So let's see, I'm going through the questions here. Um, there's been a, a request for the, the presentation, so I'll record your email. The next for question sure. from Tom, um, it says, capital retention was mentioned for nonprofit organizations. Can you share a successful example of capital retention for nonprofits? Yes, yes, I can. Um, Public Health Foundation. I did a lot of work with the Public Health Foundation, uh, and we got a lot of funding from the Centers for Disease Control, CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, Health and Human Services, and we got the funding in the, in the area of grants. So we would then send, we would build training, and we would go out to local public health departments to provide that training. And we would be 1099 or contract employees through this not-for-profit organization. And the Public Health Foundation is based out of Washington, D.C., and is, is a very upstanding organization. So we would work with them and do everything we could in the grant to be as, um, what's the word I want? As frugal as possible. We would not spend all the grant money, even if we thought that we, we needed $1,500 to fly out to Oregon, Portland, Oregon, to talk to the Portland Public Health Foundation or Public Health uh, Office. 
um, we would save that money because there were certain areas that were identified by that grant where if we didn't use all of the travel expense money, there were a couple of different buckets. We could take the overage of expense money and put it into an area where we could spend more time on creating more training or making more technology. Actually, that's not true. We could not move it over into technology for some ungodly reason, but we could use it for other areas. We could use it for uh, further uh, instructional design. We could use it for materials development, and we could make that material still available back to Portland by instead of spending a lot of money flying us back and forth and feeding us more than just basic food, um, we would use that extra money and tie it into materials that then we could leave with the public health department. So we, we retained the capital from the uh, controllable costs and moved them into different buckets that, that further supported the outcome, the real return on investment for that grant. Thank you for that, Curtis. Um, I'm going through some of the other questions. The next comment is from Austin. Uh, he said he loves the description of quality professionals being polyglots. And I don't know if that's in <laughs> reference to the, to the multiple tools in, in people's toolboxes. Yes. yes. Another question from Tom. It says when a three-lens stool was mentioned earlier, uh, he just wanted to clarify, were you referring to price, delivery, and quality? Yes, I was, and I stumbled over my tongue. Thank you. You're exactly right. I've, I've, I've heard it in slightly different words. Sometimes quality is called value, or cost is called value, and schedule is called delivery. Quality is generally pretty much the solid word. But sometimes delivery and schedule get mixed, and value and um, cost get, get swapped. Great. Um, a question from Carl. I think I can answer this one. He asked about the Jonah position. Is it certified, and who does the certification? Um, I know that's a certification offered through the Gold Rat Institute, but does ASQ have anything similar that they offer for a Jonah certification? Not called a Jonah, although somebody may know something I don't know. I do know that the Lean Enterprise Division has set up some levels of lean certification, like the lean bronze, silver, and gold certification from some of the other uh, lean organizations. So there is something that I've just seen recently that has come out that you might want to take a look at under certification, or you might want to double check with the lean enterprise division. I have not gotten into that. I am a Six Sigma master black belt, and I'm just, that, that's it for me. I'm not going any farther but I, I have the Lean and Six Sigma side of it through the Harrington Institute. But yes, yeah. just recently I have seen something through ASQ, but I don't think it's called Jonah. I think that is registered through the Gold Rat Institute. Yeah, and, and, and that's good to know, because I know like the Society of Manufacturing Engineers has offered the Lean Bronze and Gold They're certifications. The thank you. Okay, got it. So and, and, and that's great to hear if ASQ is partnering with that. That's another great yeah, organization. I just saw it recently. Excellent. So I'll, I'll wait another minute. I don't see any other questions listen, listed here in the chat box, but if there's anything else, I'll wait another 30 seconds or so uh, for anything to show up. As usual, like I said, the presentation has been recorded. What we'll do is give me a couple weeks, and what I'll do is I'll download that into my computer, I'll convert it, and we'll upload it to the YouTube channel for the AFQ Inspection Division, and then we'll put a link to the profile there where anybody can download the slides straight from the Google Drive. That's great, uh, I and I am fine. Send me an email. We can continue this dialogue. I do answer my phone, although I turn it off at night about 8.30. My cell phone, that cell phone goes with me when I travel, so I won't bother giving you my home phone number, although I've been at home as much as anybody else since last March. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to open up soon. Yeah, that, that would be great. Hopefully we can book you again for another topic next year. Uh, this, is, this is a great presentation tonight. Uh, there aren't any other questions. So with that said, I want to thank all the participants for calling in this evening. Uh, we'll stay tuned for our next presentation next month. It'll be on the same date. And without further ado, I will close things out and end the recording.
Thank you very much, Grace. Uh, I'll chat with you later at some other point, and we will be uh, reaching out to you for your contact information to send out uh, a small token of appreciation on behalf of the inspection division. So thank you again. Oh, well, that's very nice. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I look forward to working with you again. Bye-bye. Have a great night, everyone.